Welcome back to What Happens Next, the podcast that examines some of the biggest challenges facing our world and asks the experts, what will happen if we don't change? And what can we do to create a better future? I'm Dr. Susan Carland. Keep listening to find out what happens next. The beauty of escapes, the beauty of uh, accessing these extraordinary realms is that the experience is temporary. I think that that was really something noticeable about the last two or three years was that there was a couple of years there, yeah, where it was just, escapism was just, imagine if the world was nice, you know? So if you understand that, you understand what addiction is about. You're hitting that slot machine and you're just seeing the numbers and you're excited to see what's going to come up next. Let's start this episode with a quick trip back in time. We're going back to high school English class where you've been assigned Aldous Huxley's dystopian classic, Brave New World. As you remember, of course, it's a book about a society called the World State where escapism reigns supreme. In the London of Huxley's imagination, some 500 years from now, citizens are constantly consuming the mind-numbing drug Soma and distracting themselves with non-stop entertainment and diversions. As a consequence, they've sacrificed their individuality and lost touch with the harsh realities of the world. Look, there you are, writing a very insightful essay about the ways a society that prioritises pleasure and avoids discomfort will go downhill fast and how you're sure it will never come to that in real life. Great work. I bet that will age really well. Okay, back to the future. Oh dear, I hate to say it, but I'm not sure your essay has aged well after all. It's never been easier to access entertainment and amusements. You can stream infinite movies and television shows to a device in your pocket or any screen in your home. You can connect with people who share your interests instantly online and start the world's biggest Dungeons and Dragons game. You can buy the next book on your to read list and it's ready to go in your Kindle in seconds. And once you finish that one, you can immediately buy the next one and the next one and the next one. If reality gets a bit much, and let's face it, it is a bit much at the minute, you can tune out at any time. But is that a good thing? Today on the podcast, we're discussing escapism. Everyone wants to get away from it all sometimes, even if it's just to binge watch Married at First Sight. But what happens when you have too much of a good thing? Keep listening to find out what happens next. Hi, my name is Dr. Whitney Monaghan. I'm a lecturer in communications and media studies in the School of Media, Film and Journalism. I'm the co-convener of the Monash Gender and Media Lab, and I spend a lot of my time watching reality TV. Whitney, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. How would you define escapism? Escapism, it's such an interesting concept, isn't it? The idea that we... Um, need to or want to escape from something in our real lives or in reality. But I'm interested in the question of what are we escaping to? Where are we going? What are we doing with things that um, gives us that feeling of escapism? Um, And are we really escaping? Dr. Michael W. Clune is a writer and critic and a professor at Ohio's Case Western Reserve University. He believes that when we seek out escapist activities, we're actually seeking to shift our way of thinking. It's an interesting um, idea. Sometimes people think of escapism as escaping reality. Um, My own view is that it's less about trying to get outside of reality because reality is a a very mysterious and deep and complex thing. Um, It's more about trying to get out of our habitual mind states and the frames of reference which produce a constricted and reduced picture of reality for us. Hmm. Um, And so uh, different ways of getting out of that, and that can be something like your job, it could be something like relationship patterns, it can be something like social norms. Um, And and escapism is a a means of sort of perforating uh, uh, those habits and that mental state um, and, and getting outside of it. That's such a great way to put it, to perforate it. I love that image. 
Hi, my name is Clem Basto. I am a screenwriting researcher and cultural critic from Melbourne. You may see my work in The Guardian and The Saturday Paper, and I'm just about to hand in my PhD on the intersection between autism, screenwriting and Hollywood action films. As a cultural critic, Clem spent a lot of time analysing the latest trends on screen, both big and small. Given the state of the world recently, it's little wonder that our desire to escape is reflected in the content we consume. Sometimes we're looking for a better place than the one we really inhabit, and maybe even a better world entirely. What's been interesting in the last couple of years, obviously we're still in a pandemic, but I think in those few, uh, those, those first few years where everything felt very acute and very scary, um, what was interesting was how much escapist media became very cosy, you know. I don't think people wanted to imagine, for example, a global pandemic. Um, so people like me who maybe used to watch uh, Steven Soderbergh's <laughs> Contagion regularly <laughs> suddenly didn't want to watch that anymore. Um, and so I think I think that was really interesting. And I, and I actually think now there's a bit of a pushback against it where we've sort of come out the other side and maybe people are finding, for example, Ted Lasso a bit too soft and, and, and cuddly. You know, we're sort of longing for things that uh, challenge our worldviews a bit more. But I think, I think that that was really something noticeable about the last two or three years was that there was a couple of years there, yeah, where it was just escapism was just imagine if the world was nice, you know. Escapist activities give us the chance to run away in search of a better time too. It doesn't matter if it never really existed. David Orazi is an associate professor of marketing in Monash University's business school. As part of his research, he studies a phenomenon called pseudo nostalgia. It's basically largely like nostalgia, in that it is a sense of longing for a space and a time that is no longer accessible, that is meaningful for us, with the uh, difference that we have not experienced that. Right. The main differentiator is that the pseudo part is that we've never been there, right? So if I'm longing for the Middle Ages because it's a time of uh, heroes and chivalry, that is pseudo-nostalgia. I have not mm. been there in the first place, but still there is something that's appealing to me. And so do you think that pseudo-nostalgia is a form of escapism? Partially, I would say, as every movement towards another place, it tends to be idealized. So again, the, the Middle Ages, it's something that we remember based on attributes that probably we seek. So we're not concentrating on the fact that we're pandemics and the average survival rate was very low. We are looking at a bright part of it. So in a way, we are trying to focus. I don't know if I'm disenamored about current values and we think, oh, back in the days, uh, everything was much more meaningful, much more heroic. There were opportunities. And, and so in a way, yes, we are trying to uh, seek something that we miss in everyday life and escape into. Uh, another era, another time then is more inspiring. Pseudo nostalgia seems to be quite common in our culture at the moment. But then when I was thinking about it, I realized it's common beyond just Australian culture, for example. Not long ago, I was watching an extremely popular series um, out of Turkey that was, um, you know, very lightly based on history, but it was phenomenally popular from Turkey to Pakistan. And what I've noticed that seems to unite all of these um, pseudo nostalgia um, uh, approaches, I suppose, is that they're incredibly generous with the truth. They're, it paints a very idealized form of what it would have been like back then. Is that your sense as well? Does pseudo nostalgia seem to be very um, overly good? Yeah, absolutely. Because again, as a form of escapism, in a way, you want to escape in a better place, right? If you're bored, you want to go in a place that's more exciting. If you're dissatisfied, you want to go in a place in which something on offer is better. Even with Stranger Things, it's um, in, the, in the 80s. So everything that you uh, see is like fashion, uh, the flashy clothes, uh, music, and great bands of the time like Metallica. But nobody tells you about like Tiananmen Square or the AIDS crisis or the fact that John Lennon was shot, right? You don't really... Mm. Yeah, there is a bit of that discourse about uh, American Russia and the Cold War, but again, it's all reframed in a very heroic uh, and um, uh, single uh, single view, right? Like the Russians are the evil guys, so there's no leeway there. It's everything is very heroicized and very uh, narrative in that sense. 
If you listen to our influencers episode earlier this season, you won't be surprised to learn that we're often seeking better people too, even if our relationship with them is only in our heads. Clem's experienced this personally. I often step back from my daydreaming and go, is it, you know, perhaps I should just go and see my actual friends instead of like thinking about this world in which I'm besties with, for example, you know, all of the actors who, whose work I've been watching constantly for the last four years doing this PhD. Um, they're not my actual friends. <laughs> and I had the same thing um, during the pandemic, you know, during lockdown, we had ABC on so much. And I remember my my partner at the time just having to kind of gently remind me, it's okay if we go out, like, you know, your friends at the ABC are not going to be sad if you don't watch the 7pm bullets. <laughs> Michael Rowland will understand if you're not there. <laughs> That's it. Our to-do lists are too long, our wallets are too empty and our tempers are too short. And now what's this? Mark Zuckerberg's releasing another app we have to learn about. Ah, It's too much. No wonder we want to all just get away from it all, even if it's just a Netflix marathon on the couch. But was Aldous Huxley right? Is this behaviour a slippery slope? What happens when our escapist tendencies go too far? For one thing, there's some internalised social shame we maybe experience when we indulge. It's interesting, isn't it? Because often when we speak about, you know, I binge watched whatever for six hours on a Saturday and I feel I feel so gross <laughs> and I can't believe I did it and there's a bit of shame. But it's interesting because if I said to you I was reading an amazing book, I couldn't Ugh. put it down, I read it for six hours straight, I would never say to you that I was binge reading, like this is just <laughs> being immersed in a book and no one, I think generally, no one would see that as a negative thing. Yeah, I think there is still so much baggage around television, you know, from from the moment it was invented, it was this, uh, you know, was it television that was the opiate of the masses or has everything been the opiate of the masses at some point? I don't know. <laughs> but uh, I think it it still has that that baggage attached to it that it's a sort of, yeah, it's a slovenly thing. And I think, yeah, the binge to your point, the kind of negativity, negative connotations of binging is absolutely apt. It is seen as a kind of value-free activity. We also run the risk of not being able to return to reality as cleanly as we may have hoped. As part of his research, David studies live-action role-playing. For people listening who don't know, can you explain what LARPing or live-action role-playing is? Yes, so my, my great hope is that by now, after Stranger Things and uh, a number of podcasts like Critical Role, everybody knows what a normal role-playing game is. But in case in a role-playing game, it's the classic game in which uh, a bunch of people and friends uh, gather around a table with character sheets and manuals. And as a matter of fact, I was actually playing Dungeons and Dragons, the original second edition yesterday, um, and simulate action. Uh, using dice and uh, and other character sheets, and so it's like a choral narration. But everything happens in uh, in your mind. In live action role playing, we are replacing imagination, just like living the dream. So you actually you don't interpret your character. You dress as your character. You don't like a suit of armor. You have a sword, and you're playing with another three hundred people in a castle. Live action role playing is a version of role playing games in which we are uh, removing the imagination component or rather supplanting it with like a lived experience. Right, so I'm embodying my character, I'm dressing and donning a suit of armor with a sword, and I'm playing in an evocative location. So, probably a castle, if it's a medieval LARP or a former movie set. Um, part of our research in Spain was in a in the desert of Almeria, in a Western uh, Hollywood set. And you interact for three days as it was uh, improvisational play, like improvisational theater, but everything happened physically. So the experience is different, it's more intense, it's more visceral, and it allows you to explore uh, aspects of yourself and your corporeality as well. Sometimes it's hard to separate fantasy from real life once your experience has ended. David and his fellow researchers have come across a phenomenon known as reality bleed. There are three main types of bleed that we have quoted in a recent research paper. Like reality bleed is like in general the aggregate term, but um, 
Uh, by bleed, we are defining the process for which when you are entering one of these worlds, these alternative uh, realms, and you spend time being somebody else and experiencing gather logics and norms, so when you come back to your everyday life, regardless of how satisfied you are with that, they're like it, it's, it's a form of longing, almost like of nostalgia of the experience that you had. It's not too different from if you spent, I don't know, two weeks in Italy and you travel from Florence to Rome and you meet all these people and and travel through history. When you come back, there's some sort of uh, of longing for that experience. And Bleed is exactly that. But for a place that does not exist and for people that do not exist, they were contained over three days. And, mm. um, and now you come back and your mind is like missing something that's no longer there. So that is Bleed. And it's a powerful force because it allows you to reassess uh, logics and norms. I was just going to say, sometimes when I finish a particularly gripping book of fiction or a TV show, I find that I'm missing the characters or um, the place that it was set. But often the characters, is that reality bleed or is that a, a different thing to what you're talking about with, say, LARPing? It's it's related. I think it's called um, longing for parasocial relationships, uh, somebody I think Russell and uh, and Sean talked about that. But like the logic is the same. Uh, you become attached to mm. the people that you have lived this extraordinary experience for days and the places that you have uh, navigated and explored. And now you come back and all your thinking is, I want to go back. And also sometimes you have this conflict mm. between, oh, I live in this world that has these certain norms and, and logics. But in that experience to where or inspiring things, or even completely different ways of living, like uh, human-robot interactions. We don't really have that much here, but there are some LARPs that simulate, like Westworld, that force you to consider how would I behave with a sentient android without the limits of consciousness and so on. And because you've never really interrogated yourself mm -hmm. about these questions, and they're big ones, they, they're just like there in the back of your mind. You are in front of your computer, you're writing, and like suddenly, so are androids alive? Do they have a consciousness? a lot. But could the consequences of escapism go beyond feeling a bit gross about how you spent the past weekend or sitting at your desk? Scaring yourself with existential questions about robots? Can escapism become an addiction? Do you think that there is anything negative about us enjoying pseudo nostalgia or is it just, you know, it's a fun, relatively frivolous, but non-problematic escapism. If it becomes an alternative to your current existence and not like a break that you used to reassess a current situation of just like some energy back, then it becomes a little bit more problematic. Like video gaming addiction would be one of the most classic examples, right? If you spent 16 hours playing World of Warcraft, you may not want to admit it, but you have. Culturally, we associate video games in particular with addiction. Michael is uniquely qualified to weigh in here. Um, I, I have experience with, with both. Uh, as far as addiction goes, I was uh, a heroin addict for a number of years. You know, for, for a number of years, I've been clean for 21 years. But um, I was an addict to drugs from the age of 14 about till I got clean at 26. So I have thorough experience with addiction. Um, and in terms of escapism, um, it's it's a something that's always fascinated me, something I feel is um, in, vital to life and uh, something I've written about, both in terms of computer games, in terms of literature and art and music, all of which I, I, I feel to be different forms of escapism. And then how would you see the relationship between escapism and addiction, say drug addiction? Yeah, so I, I feel, and, and, and very often I think those two notions are conflated where people will um, worry that uh, if, if someone is escaping um, that they're, they may fall into addiction. For me, addiction is more like... I want to go deeper into the conversation with Michael in part two of this series. For now, let's talk video games. There's different kind. I would say there's different kinds of games. There's all, you know... There, the, the numbers of genres of games since I've been around have proliferated and multiplied. And there are some games I feel like can have an addictive tendency. The games that fascinate me tend not to. And I'll explain what I mean pretty briefly. Um, there's some uh, uh, neuroscientific research that I find very persuasive based on my own experience that suggests that the most basic form of addiction is gambling. Just 
waiting for that little flash of something to appear, right? Um, and, and there's a great anecdote about gambling addiction, which I think is fascinating. For the true gambling addict, when they hit the jackpot of the slot machine, they get depressed. Because what that means is it's going to be a wait and a delay before they can hit that slot machine again. So it, 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 if you understand that, you understand what addiction is about. You're hitting that slot machine and you're just seeing the numbers and you're excited to see what's going to come up next. There are games that put you into loops where you're just sort of looking under little boxes and trees and waiting for that next little flash. Uh, those kinds of games, I feel, can be addictive. The games that fascinate me, which we often call uh, uh, role-playing games, um, are games in which you uh, uh, th there's, there's a different world that's created and you explore the world through the game. And those games I don't find to be addictive. They operate according to quite a different logic. So while I would definitely hesitate to say that games as such are addictive, I think there are some types of games uh, uh, that do activate the same kinds of dopamine cycles uh, that drugs and gambling can do. But I would say along that path, that desire for escapism, along that path, it's possible certain pitfalls can open up and certain kinds of escapes can decay into addictive cycles, right? So something, for example, um, many people like to use drugs recreationally, right? They might use, and I had friends who would use drugs, even hard drugs, once in a while, never get addicted to them. It'd be a little escape for them. Well, eventually, and it was like that for me in the beginning as well, but eventually um, it hijacked my brain, right? So that it was now, the, 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 uh, it, uh, far from being an escape from the ordinary, it had imprisoned me in a far more constricting version of our habitual mind state from which there was literally no escape until the police came in and locked me up, right? Um, so- so I feel like many kinds of escapism have, and that desire for escapism has the potential to decay uh, into, um, into an addictive pattern or cycle. So, so um, that's how I would think about it, at least from my own experience. So are we all lab rats frantically hitting a button until we get our next dopamine hit? And was Huxley right? Are we headed for a not-so-brave new world full of brain-dead couch potatoes? Next week on What Happens Next, we'll talk about the upsides of stepping outside reality. Just for a moment. Thank you to all our guests on today's episode, Dr. Whitney Monaghan, Dr. Clem Basto, Associate Professor David Orazi, and Professor Michael W. Clune. You can learn more about their work by visiting our show notes. We'll be back next week with part two of this series. 